Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 15 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. This week, we're starting to look at basic queen rearing techniques for beginner beekeepers. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. So welcome back to my weekly podcast and my thanks to those of you listening via the Patreon page. I really appreciate your support. If you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a support page where you can help me create more content by signing up to one of my reward tiers and in return you gain access to additional content and support from me. These start from as little as $1 per month. I don't charge per video or per podcast, so I believe that with the regular quality content I'm producing, $1 represents excellent value for money. If you've not yet started beekeeping and you're looking for help and assistance, pop over to my website, www.norfolk-honey.co.uk forward slash get started, and I'll do all I can to help out with suggestions and recommendations for you. I'll leave links to the various websites in this week's show notes as usual. Well, it's been a fantastic week for me. We've just signed up to a new sponsorship deal for our main apiary site for the season, and we'll be converting it over to Langstroth hives, which I've never used before, so I'm really excited about it. We've teamed up with Paul Beardmore, the owner and beekeeper at the Happy Valley Honey Co., to use their Honey Pour Poly Langstroth hives exclusively throughout the active season in our main apiary site. Paul is a UK-based bee farmer with around 120 hives, so he knows what he's talking about, and he reckons these hives are fantastic. Watch out for the videos coming out on my YouTube channel, and check out the range of equipment on Paul's website, www.happyvalleyhoney.co.uk. The Happy Valley Honey Co. can ship worldwide, so there's nothing stopping you from placing an order, and remember to catch up with all the videos. The first technique I'm going to show is carrying out a shook swarm. It's an easy way to move a colony from my commercial hive types that we use into these Langstroth hives, but a method that some beginner beekeepers are a little unsure of. Anyway, that's a topic for another day, but again my thanks to Paul at Happy Valley Honey for supporting me in my endeavours in trying to bring you all more tips, techniques and know-how on this beekeeping journey that we're all sharing together. Today I wanted to touch on some basic queen rearing techniques, it's that time of the year when colonies are starting to swarm, and I'll be referencing the books that I use at the end of the podcast, so stay tuned until then. I'll also pop the details in the show notes as usual along with all the other web addresses, so you can find them there if you're in a hurry. So, basic queen rearing. I know some beginners shudder at the very thought of queen rearing, but I suspect most of you have raised queens already without even knowing it. If your colony has ever swarmed, congratulations, you've just raised a new queen. It really is as simple as that. Most of the time the bees know exactly what to do, it's their natural reproductive method, and will leave a new queen behind in the old hive. But that can be a bit hit and miss, and we're losing a lot of bees in allowing the colony to swarm, and of course it could be a nuisance to our neighbours or other members of the public that are in the area. So what about a more controlled, basic method of queen rearing that doesn't mean you lose half your colony to the beekeeper down the road? There's always someone willing to collect one of your swarms. So we'll start with some basics. Let's assume that you're inspecting your bees and you find the queen some eggs, but also those dreaded queen cells. Let's imagine that there are seven queen cells all on one frame, hanging from the bottom of the comb at the base of the frame. These are more than likely swarm cells and are a good indicator that your colony is getting ready to reproduce and swarm. So we can use a method called the artificial swarm to prevent swarming and produce a new queen. Of course I've produced a video showing the technique, but let's talk through the process step by step. This then is your first step into queen rearing. You'll need an additional beehive to perform this technique, so a stand, floor, brood box, crown board and roof, but that's what birthdays, Christmas and all those other special occasions are for, the accumulation of beekeeping equipment. Make sure that you hand a list round to all of your relatives. 
It can be really helpful if you've got someone to help lift things around with you, but it can be done on your own if you're careful, and just don't try to lift too much in one go. So let's go through the process step by step. Before you begin, remember to light your smoker and put on your bee suit. So with the artificial swarm, step one is simply to move the original hive, and we'll call the original hive Hive A. Move the original hive to a new position about one meter or two or three feet away from the original position with the entrance pointing in the same way. Step two, place a new hive full of frames of foundation. Ideally, if you have drawn comb, then that would be excellent. But for most of us, using foundation is perfectly acceptable. So place a new hive full of frames of foundation, we'll call this hive B, on a stand in the position of the original hive. So where you move the original hive from, you're now placing this new hive. Open it up and remove a couple of frames from the middle of the brood box to give you some space to access the center of the brood box. Step three, this is a little trick. Go and have a drink, sit down and listen to this podcast again. This will help you find the queen, believe it or not. What happens is the flying bees that are out foraging will head back to the hive that's positioned on the original hive site. Now remember, that's hive B. This has the effect of reducing the number of bees in the old hive, hive A, and it makes life a lot easier when you're trying to find the queen. So step four, open up hive A, the original hive, and inspect them, looking specifically for the queen. Once you've found the queen, move her and the frame that she's on into the new hive, hive B. Check the frame she's on for queen cells. For this example, we'll assume that the frame has not got any queen cells on it. Ideally, you want a frame that has emerging brood, so it gives the queen lots of cells to continue laying eggs into. If it has, then that's fine. Just pop it in place. If it hasn't, just swap out that frame for a different one with emerging brood and move the queen onto that replacement frame. So you're only putting one frame of drawn comb with emerging brood and the old queen into the new hive, which is hive B. And this, in effect, is your artificial swarm. It consists of the old queen and bees similar to that, which makes up a natural swarm. And they'll now go on to start building up without the impulse to swarm. Step five, find the frame with the queen cells on it. So in this example, we're saying there's only one frame with queen cells and there are seven queen cells on it. Now my preference is to remove all of the queen cells except for one. So choose a queen cell that's still open so that you can see the larvae and the royal jelly inside it and destroy all the others, even the sealed ones. Use a handful of grass to gently brush all the bees away so that you can really check that there are no more queen cells on that frame but be very careful not to damage the queen cell that you've chosen. Don't shake the bees off, for example, or you could dislodge the larvae from the royal jelly. There's also a temptation with beginner beekeepers to leave a sealed queen cell, as it might seem that you gain some time in waiting for her to emerge, but there's a chance that the new virgin queen could drift into the artificial swarm so that's hive B, and then be destroyed by the old queen and her workers. So just be patient and all will work out fine. And I'll explain a little bit of the reasoning behind that in a few minutes. Step six, continue to inspect hive A, but now shake all of the bees off each frame and make sure there are no more queen cells. And this is really important. Go through very carefully and inspect each comb meticulously to remove any more queen cells. Once you've checked all the frames, gently close the frames up together and place a frame of foundation in the end of the brood box to replace the frame that you removed, which is now in hive B with the old queen. Place any supers that were on the original hive, hive A, across onto hive B with the old queen. Remember to move the queen excluder if you've got a queen excluder in place as well. And then simply close up that hive. Step seven... Now you can start to feel smug that you've successfully prevented a likely swarm and started the process of rearing a new queen. So now we can leave these colonies alone for a week. So step eight, a week later, you can move hive A, that's the old hive, 
across to the other side of the new hive, which is on the original position, that's hive B, your artificial swarm, again leaving it about a metre away from the original hive position. The reason for doing this is that the workers that have started flying and foraging in hive A will return from foraging and boost the numbers of bees in the artificial swarm, that's hive B. This is why you remove any queen cells that were sealed in the earlier procedure. The newly mated queen could drift into the artificial swarm and be destroyed. In his book A Guide to Bees and Honey, Ted Hooper says that there's no need to remove additional queen cells because the bees will reduce them due to the sudden reduction in bee numbers in the colony. I prefer to make sure by just leaving the one queen cell, and that's why I remove all of those queen cells in the original procedure. Step 9. Check Hive A for food stores. Remember, we left the supers with the artificial swarm, which is Hive B, and so our original colony may be low on food stores. If they are, simply add a feeder and give them a few litres of sugar syrup to help them along. Step 10. Inspect the artificial swarm to make sure the old queen is laying well and congratulate yourself on a job well done. So now you have two colonies, but what if you only wanted to produce a new queen and not increase the number of colonies you have overall? And this is something that a lot of beginners are really keen to do. They don't want to have lots of additional colonies clogging up their back garden. So the final step is performed after you've been able to confirm the new queen is well mated and laying a good brood pattern, and that's really important. So I would leave it a few weeks after she started laying, just to confirm that all is well. Mark her with the colour for the current year. I don't clip the wings of my queens, but if you do, then go ahead and do that. And the trick now is to unite the two colonies. So first of all, open hive B. That's the new hive that's on the old hive position, the artificial swarm with the old queen in it. Find the old queen and remove her. Next, add a sheet of newspaper to the top of the brood box, and that's the brood box in hive B, and make a few small holes in it to aid the removal process. Place the brood box of hive A, the original hive with the new queen in it, on top of the bottom brood box. Close down the colony and over the next few hours the bees will slowly chew through the newspaper and the colony will unite. Congratulations, you have successfully raised a new queen and replaced the old queen without increasing the total number of colonies you have. So that's the artificial swarm, a really simple method of producing a new queen that can replace the old queen, or if you wanted to, you could leave the two colonies separated and have an increase of one additional hive. And for the beginner beekeeper, it's a really effective way of getting stuck into some queen rearing. Your first tentative steps of producing queens to suit your beekeeping when you want to. No longer do you have to go onto the internet and pay 40 or 50 pounds for a replacement queen because you can replace them all by yourself. Next time I'll expand on producing nukes from a parent colony so that you can actually increase the number of colonies you've got. And then beyond that we'll look at some other queen rearing techniques that you might like to attempt yourself or perhaps in a small group of beekeepers from your local association. So I mentioned the books that I like to have on hand when I'm checking up on my queen rearing techniques. The first one I've already mentioned, which is The Guide to Bees and Honey by Ted Hooper, which is really the beekeeper's bible of beekeeping here in the UK. My favourite queen rearing book is called Queen Bee Biology, Rearing and Breeding by David Woodward. And finally, I have a fantastic book called The Principles of Bee Improvement by Joe Widdicombe. And you can find links to all of those on my website, and I'll also post the details in the show notes as usual. Please do let me know how you get on with your queen rearing and thanks for hanging on to the end of this podcast. Good luck with your beekeeping journey and I'll catch up with you again next week. I'm Stuart Spinks and that was Beekeeping Short and Sweet. Sweet.